The room is getting quiet organically, so I guess that means it's time to start. It's not quite uh, Berkeley time yet. Uh, well, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce again uh, Dr. Rebecca uh, Tarvin for her second uh, talk as, as part of her interview for the faculty position in IB and MBZ. I suspect many of you were at her talk yesterday. Uh, she received her uh, PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, working with David Canatella and Harold Zakin. And uh, before that, did her undergraduate work at uh, Boston University. Uh, she's currently in a postdoc at UT Austin. And as she uh, mentioned yesterday, we'll be starting a Miller uh, a fellow uh, position here working jointly with Rasmus Nielsen and, and uh, Noah Whiteman uh, this, this summer. Uh, she's done a lot of beautiful work, as we heard yesterday, on the evolution of uh, uh, resistance to toxins in poison frogs, so how poison frogs don't poison themselves. But she's also uh, done a lot of work on uh, the diversification of frogs and color variation. I think that's probably what we'll hear about today. But one of the things I didn't mention yesterday uh, about uh, Becca that's uh, really remarkable is the amount of field work that she's done. So I was looking at her uh, CV, and I, I don't know exactly how many trips, but it looked like something like eight or nine uh, different uh, trips, uh, largely to the neotropics. So she's done work in, in uh, Ecuador, a lot of work in Ecuador and Colombia. Uh, but also some work in Central America and even in, in Africa. Um, so she's, uh, we, we didn't hear about this yesterday. We mostly saw pictures of protein sequences and, and, and things, but uh, um, uh, she has done a lot of field work as well. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Rebecca again. I know this is not a normal time for the MBZ, MBZ seminar, so I'm really pleased to be such a large crowd, so thank you. So I'm really intrigued by chemically dependent organisms, in part because of the huge array of bright, attractive colors that they have. And the evolution of chemical defense paired with an, a warning signal, often the, these bright colors, is known as aposematism. And the evolution of these bright colors has long been a classic conundrum because, by definition, a showy signal should place an organism at a higher risk for predation and thus should be removed quickly from the gene pool. However, clearly, aposematism has evolved many times in many different types of animals. So how, do, how has this happened? This brings me to um, my general research program which is uh, trying to understand the causal genetic mechanisms underlying novel traits like avocematism, so specifically chemical defenses and bright coloration. And I spoke about some of that yesterday, about how poison frogs resist their own poisons. Secondly, I'm interested in how phenotypes diversify at both macro and micro evolutionary scales. So yesterday I spoke about the macro scale, and today I'm going to talk about at the micro scale, how do colors and defenses change over time uh, in a closely related group of poison frogs? Thirdly, I'm interested in identifying factors that promote and constrain biodiversity. So does the origin of chemical defenses promote the evolution of bright coloration? And does the origin of bright colors thus promote diversification of these colors? So how do these, these novel phenotypes generate or constrain biodiversity. And my two main systems that I'm currently working in are the poison frogs. So poison frogs are a large group of neotropical frogs. There's about 310 species. Of these, although we call them all poison frogs, of these, only about 100 are actually poisonous. And this actually makes the system quite interesting to work in because it means that we have replicate origins of conversion um, convergent origins of aposematism. So we can compare between close, closely related clades differences that might be underlying these shifts towards the evolution of aposematism. And my second major research program is with the youngest of these clades, so this branch right here. And this is the group of poison frogs called Epipedobates. And that's what I'll be talking about today. So to study these, these questions, I integrate three main fields in biology. 
Firstly, phylogenomics. So I use these convergent evolution, evolutionary events of, uh, of aposematism to study the genetics that underlie these, to identify the genetics underlying these shifts in phenotype. And often this also involves resolving alpha level taxonomy. Secondly, I once identified these genetic changes, I use physiological assays to test whether they result in the phenotypic uh, changes that we observe. And thirdly, I take a, more, a broader view of these organisms and look to see how these genetic and phenotypic changes have resulted in ecological changes within those organisms and the ecosystems in which they live. So together, by merging these, these fields of biology, I, I study the evolution, evolutionary biology of aposematism. Okay, so in my talk today, I have three main parts. First, just an overview of biodiversity of poison frogs, followed by um, <coughs> zooming in and looking at this youngest clade, Epipedobates, and I'll explain why, why they're so interesting, and, and look in detail at how aposematism has evolved in this group. And then I'll touch on future research, so where are, the, where are these uh, research programs going? As I said, poison frogs are a group of about 310 species, and depending on which taxonomy you follow, uh, they're either in about 15 or, or 20 different genera. And again, here, these are the names of the, the clades that have chemical defenses in red. So here is Epipedobates. They evolved approximately three to five million years ago. Amarega is, is a little bit larger group, and they evolved about uh, eight million years ago. And this dendrobatini clade evolved approximately 10 million years ago. And these frogs live all over Central and Southern uh, America. And they're found in three major biogeographical ranges. So in the Choco, which is what we call the forest west of the Andes, also across the Andes and into the Amazon. You can find them in all sorts of habitats, in dry tropical forests, <coughs> in wet tropical forests, in degraded habitat along the roadsides, in puddles, in, uh, in the treetops. So some of them are bromeliad specialists, and you find them up only high in the trees. There's a, a number of lineages found that have huge uh, ranges. These are genus level range maps. Uh, and here I've color coded the ones in red that have chemical defenses. These are just representatives of each genus. And uh, there's a number of genera here that do have chemical defenses, as well as some that don't. The ones that live in the Andes generally don't have chemical defenses, which is kind of interesting. And the, most of the lineages that live within the Chocoan region, which is quite small in comparison to the Amazon, most of these have chemical defenses. And among these is my favorite genus, Epiphytobates, uh, and they range from northwestern Peru all the way up to central western Colombia. So this is a video I took in 2016, and we, were, we went to survey this site that had been within the zone of conflict in, in Colombia, and this is the, the type locality of Epipedobates narinensis. It's named for the, the, pro, the Nariño province in southern Colombia. So this species was described in 2008. So what we did, we recorded their call. We're playing the call on the speaker right here. So in 2008, it was described as a new species. Yeah, it keeps running. And uh, no one had seen this species since we went in 2016. So he's desperately looking for the male that's calling, the ghost male. <laughs> so poison frogs are, are really fun to work with. They are territorial. So this is a male frog. He's trying to defend his territory from the ghost frog that is somewhere near the speaker. Um, and so this is a video of the same site, the same species. These are two males. And they're in an intense battle. <laughs> so this is a video, I only watched part of this battle. They were going at this for quite some time. You can imagine this is actually a very um, energetically costly behavior. But it's because they, they defend territories where they, they defend areas to where the tadpoles can develop and potentially also chemical resources. I want you to notice right here, this one is a slightly different shade of green. So in, in poison frogs, uh, color is expected to be under sexual selection. And there's evidence that 
brighter males tend to be more aggressive, that individuals respond to brighter males more aggressively, and that females are generally more attracted to brighter males. So these color signals are evolving not only under sexual selection, but also under natural selection. Right? So we, we assume that they've evolved <coughs> as a signal to show predators that they are chemically defended. So often when you, when you see these frogs in the wild, the males will have cuts or, or healed scars on their legs. And it's not because they're physically hurting each other, it's because they're rolling around so <coughs> intensively in, in the leaf litter and they get cut up by the leaves there. Okay, so, so these are the, the three main clades of poison frogs that have chemical defenses. Epipetobates, again, this is the smallest, youngest clade, and my favorite clade. And Amarega is a uh, mid-size, it's also the, the second oldest, with 30 species. And Dendrobatini, which is, has been the focus of most of these behavioral uh, and evolutionary studies, has about 50 species. So why, what makes Epipetobates exciting? Well, um, first of all, it's, it's a wonderful place to work in. And as Michael said, I've done a, a number of field trips down to these sites. And there's, there's about seven, there's seven nominative species. I'm showing six here. And these three on the left, they all have broad <coughs> ranges. So Bull and Jerry occurs from central western Colombia all the way down to northwestern uh, Ecuador. Machalia occupies much of central western Ecuador lowlands. And Anthony occupies this southwestern part of, of Ecuador into northwestern Peru. So these species on the right, they all have these much smaller ranges that occur either within, for example, here at Naranensis, those videos I just showed. Phylogenetically, uh, or sorry, ge geographically, this species occurs within the, the, the wider Bull and Jerry range. As does Darwin Wallace, it occurs at slightly higher elevations, but still adjacent to the Bull and Jerry range. And tricolor is also allopatric at higher elevations compared to Machalia. So, and all of these have apparently ch uh, changed their coloration. The other thing that's really interesting about these frogs is that they have very low divergence, despite this high phenotypic diversity in color. Just to give you uh, a comparison, this is Ophega pamilio. It's kind of the model poison frog species that's been studied for a long time. And it's, it's famous because it's distributed across the archipelago of Bocas del Toro in Panama. So this here, this is the mainland morph. This is where it gets its name, the strawberry poison frog. Uh, sometimes they call it blue jeans frog, so it's got these uh, speckled blue pants. And on each of these islands, it's diverged and they have uh, different discrete <coughs> morphs. And across, so this is considered one species with all this diversity in color. And it's approximately 7% divergent in a mitochondrial gene. And I'd like to point out here, this is a discontinuous range, which should promote phenotypic diversification. Now if we compare that to Epipetobates, they, they contain, the group is, is split into seven nominative species. And it's similar in divergence compared to Ophega pumilio, which we consider to be one species. And these guys, they have continuous range and actually range overlaps among many of these species. So I think in poison frogs, it's, it's, it's kind of a trend that you find a new morph, a really pretty poison frog no one's ever seen before, and you do, you know, people have done kind of cursory phylogenetic analyses, and then they call it a new species. This, I think, is a problem in aposomatic groups. Um, and potentially, they've been split into more species than is warranted. So um, my first stab at the phylogeny, we, we were able to get samples from four of these species, Bull and Jerry, Anthony, Machalia, and Tricolor. And uh, what we noticed is that there's non-monophyly in two of these four species. So Bull and Jerry is, is polyphyletic with respect to the entire genus, and Machalia <coughs> is paraphyletic with respect to the subclade of Bull and Jerry and the entire clade of tricolor. So if you remember, tricolor is, is this uh, allopatric species. It's, <coughs> its range is allopatric to Machalia and occurs at higher elevations. So what's, what's going on here? 
Well, we think that between Marchalia and Bulingeri, this is evidence of a recent or old introgression event. And between Marchalia and tricolor, it's possibly evidence that the tricolor is simply a highly divergent population of Marchalia. The evidence for this is that if you look, this is a, a mitochondrial haplotype network. So if you've never seen one of these, the colored circles are, in, are individual haplotypes. The size of the circle represents the number of individuals that have that haplotype. And these black circles indicate genetic distance between them. So in blue, in the, in the center here, these are Machalia haplotypes. And in yellow and brown, these are two different populations of Bulingeri haplotypes. And clearly, some of these Bulingeri mitochondrial haplotypes are diverged from a Machalia haplotype. So there was some introduction of Machalia mitochondrial DNA into that Bulingeri population. This makes sense given the location of this particular population. It's, it's pretty close to the range overlap of Machalia and Bulingeri. And it's plausible that there has been either historic gene flow or potentially uh, gene flow still going on today. As for tricolor, so this is the location of those populations. And the interesting thing is, historically, the range of Machalia was from approximately uh, zero meters of elevation to 500 meters of elevation. And of tricolor, it was from 700 meters to 1,800 meters of elevation. So what about this 500 to 700? No one had ever done transects in this area. So that's what we went to do last year for field work. And we found some clear phenotypic intermediates. So here uh, on the top, this is a typical tricolor. So tricolor is, is very bright. They tend to have bright yellow stripes and, and green colors. They also have very prominent red markings here. And a very contrast modeled pattern on the belly. On the bottom, this is Machalia. So Machalia is much more cryptic. It usually has a cream colored belly. And this is a, a complete phenotypic intermediate. And for me, it's fairly convincing that there's, there's gene flow. And right now, we're, we're working on the genetics of, this, uh, of these populations. So what's interesting is that uh, they're so different in color. So how are, they, uh, how are they interbreeding? How are they recognizing each other? And also, they're very different in size. So they follow Bergman's rule. And up in the tricolor range, they tend to be, on average, about 5 millimeters larger than Machalia. So average size for Machalia is 15 millimeters. And for tricolor, it's 20. So that, you know, in relative sense, that's a huge difference in size. Okay, so this is still uh, in, in progress. We're, we're sequencing now. I'm creating a DDRAD phylogeny of, of all of the species now that I've been able to go and collect their anensis. Um, but generally, the pattern that we found is that there's low genetic divergence across the clade, yet high phenotypic divergence. And this implies that there's been rapid phenotypic diversification. Okay, so, so what's going on in Epipedobates? I'd like to back up and just give you a conceptual backdrop to this question. So in the, during the evolution of aposematism, we're essentially traversing an, uh, an entire adaptive landscape between two al alternate adaptive peaks. So you can either be cryptic and, and, and lack defense, or you can be highly conspicuous enough and, and have defense. But how do you go from A to B? Well, you could evolve a signal first, and this likely evolves potentially in a, a mimicry situation, so perhaps uh, Batesian mimicry evolves where a non-toxic species mimics a toxic species and then they evolve defense. Um, I haven't been able to find evidence of this in the literature, so it appears to be if this, if this occurs, fairly uncommon. Or it could evolve potentially under <coughs> sexual selection. So you could get selection for showy characteristics in the males, and then maybe that would, um, that would lead to selection for defense. However, this seems to be a fairly uncommon trajectory. The other more likely trajectory, which there is a ton of evidence for in the literature, is that defense evolves first. And like I said at the beginning, this is also a classic conundrum. So how do you evolve a color that should, by definition, promote predation of that allele? So 
more studies into predatory behavior <coughs> actually shows it's it's quite simple that it depends on this it's it's predators in general tend to avoid novel prey and they tend to be wary of bright signals whether or not they've had experience. This tends to be common across different types of predator and it's a mechanism by which color signals can evolve without potentially without increasing predation risk. The final mechanism would be something like gradual concerted change where you don't get necessarily jumps in defense or signal at first but you slowly incrementally increase both signal and defense. And a mechanism by which this could evolve is that, that predators, it's been shown that predators generalize during learning. So if there's a population that varies in color and defense signals, which is definitely the case, at least in, in Epipedobates, then predators that encounter, for example, a highly, a highly toxic individual with not necessarily a really bright signal might generalize to avoid something that's more colorful but less toxic. So this is a mechanism by which you could get intermediates evolving. So I'm interested in trying to piece together how this happens in, in natural populations. How do you go from, the, from one adaptive peak to the other? And that's what makes Epipedobates such a great system because we do see a lot of continuous variation in both of these traits. So if we think about this in kind of a stepwise evolutionary sense, we know that, that poison frogs acquire their toxins from what they eat. They, they're unable to synthesize any of their toxins and thus defense is dependent on their diet. And once an individual encounters toxins and potentially begins to use them for defense, there should be selection for resistance. And this is what I talked about at length yesterday and I'll describe it again briefly uh, in a moment. But essentially, you would expect that increasing exposure through toxins selects for increasing resistance, and that once an organism has some resistance, that should facilitate the evolution of higher defense, which then selects for higher resistance, etc. So it's kind of this internal arms race. And once defense evolves, now the opportunity arises to evolve this signal. And together, defense and signal is aposematism. So this is kind of the framework I'm thinking in of how these, this complex uh, phenotype might evolve. Okay, so, so what about diet and defense in Epipedobates? So we know that poison frogs acquire their, toxic, their chemical defenses from what they eat, which is primarily mites and ants. There have been alkaloids identified, alkaloids are, are the, the, the chemicals that they use for defense. There have been alkaloids that have been identified from things like beetles, and millipedes, but it appears that mites and ants are the most plentiful arthropods in the environment and also tend to be very common sources for these alkaloids. For a long time we've <coughs> kind of assumed, uh, and th there's some evidence that suggests that, that these origins of aposematism are associated with shifts in diet. However, there, there is kind of this limited understanding of what diet specialization is and what this means, because it depends on what's available in the environment. So I, I sorted through a lot of, of Epipedobates guts. These are photographs through a microscope of different gut contents representing kind of two extremes on this uh, diet breath uh, continuum. So on the left here, this is what a generalist might eat. So there's, there's a weevil here, there's a fly, um, there's, uh, let's see, there's a, a beetle head. And on the right here, this is an individual that, that just ate mites and it ate a ton of them. So these, these frogs are quite small, they're about a centimeter and a half long, and sometimes you find 80 mites in one, one individual's gut. So clearly they, they, they are eating a ton of these arthropods. So this is data, this is a more up-to-date phylogeny based on the data we have now, and I've color-coded the, the tips by species. So this is um, the bull and jerry clades, uh, which we're, we're resolving the taxonomy now, uh, and this is Machalia in blue, and tricolor in green, and tr uh, Anthony in yellow. And this, this grid here represents raw counts of arthropods in each prey category. And I've grouped together on the left counts of mites and ants, which are probably <coughs> the source of most of their chemical defenses. And you'll notice that they do appear to be eating mostly mites and ants, uh, however, the, the measurement 
uh, on the scale of generalized to specialized, where probably anything above 0.5 means that they're specialized on two of these categories. So I've, I've put a dotted line here at 0.5. But you might notice there's really no obvious trend across the entire genus. It appears that diet is variable, uh, individuals are variable. So if we look at this uh, against alkaloid data, so these are the same exact individuals, and the, it's a, a measurement of quantity of alkaloids. So this is a relative measurement. And you might notice here that in general, Anthony appears to have slightly higher levels of defense than the other individuals. And maybe they're also eating more mites. It, it, and if we look at this, uh, so this on, on the left, this is number of mites eaten, and on the right is alkaloid quantity. It appears that maybe there's a relationship between mites eaten and alkaloid defenses, but if there is, it's really a pattern that's driven by Anthony in particular. So if we add these traits onto the phylogeny, uh, thinking about this evolutionary time frame, we know, we've seen that all of these individuals that we sampled, all major clades have chemical defenses. So we can infer because Silverstonia does not have uh, the same level, does not have chemical defenses, that defense was present in the ancestor of Epipenobetes. And we can also infer there appears to be an increase in defense in the ancestor of the Anthony clade. And this has evolved concurrently with a, a slight change in, in the number of mites eaten. Okay, so, so we see diet maybe is influencing defense, uh, but at least defense, there, there's uh, an increase in defense in Anthony. What about resistance? So uh, uh, poison frogs have alkaloid chem chemicals that they use for defense. And alkaloids are neurotoxic, and they target different proteins in the nervous system. And these proteins are, are extremely important in the way we function, so they help us see, they help us perceive our environment, they're what govern information flow in the brain as well as muscle contraction. So all aspects of the nervous systems that we rely on uh, can be affected by these, by these alkaloids. And there's actually a very simple way that you could evolve resistance to the alkaloids and that's through something called target site insensitivity. And simply this means that normally a toxin has a specific binding site on a protein and it fits nice and snug. Now if you, if you mutate one of those amino acids, you can change the binding site just enough that the toxin can no longer bind. So to study this question in the poison frogs, what we did was, was use transcriptomics to sequence different genes that are targeted by different alkaloids. And then we looked for, for patterns of amino acid replacements that were correlated with origins of chemical defenses. So this is what I presented yesterday. Um, but briefly, we found multiple genetic changes that were correlated with, with uh, these origins of chemical defenses, and we used electrophysiology to, to determine that they do indeed provide resistance to epibetadine, which is one of the most toxic compounds that these frogs carry. Now what I want you to notice is that it evolved in the ancestor of epipetobates, so all epipetobates have this resistance. It appears to evolve at the same time that chemical defense did in this group. And one of the other proteins that I've worked with is the voltage-gated sodium channel. So this is targeted by a number of classes of toxins, including familiotoxins. And I, again, we were able to identify different amino acid substitutions that are correlated with origins of defense. So they occur primarily in these defended groups. And I use computational modeling to predict how this would change how a toxin interacts with the protein. And the models support that, that these change how the protein, how the toxin interacts and generally uh, decrease the ability of the toxin to bind. So these also suggest that, uh, at least in, in Epipetobates, that, that resistance evolved in the ancestor of this clade. So if we add resistance onto our evolutionary story, we can say that evolved, it evolved in the ancestor of Epipetobates along with defense. And it's possible then that resistance is either required or somehow facilitates the evolution of, of defense. And I just want to point out here the, the two genes that we've studied in Epipetobates don't show any variation across species, which is really interesting because at some point there had to be variation for it to evolve. 
So it's, it's plausible and, and probably likely that there's other mechanisms of resistance that exist that we haven't yet studied. And this could be changes in gene regulation or different genes that we haven't sequenced yet. So I, I would expect, for example, that Anthony might have greater resistance to different types of toxins, given that they show higher toxicity in general. Okay, so what about these bright signals? So poison frogs have been the focus of signal evolution for, for a long time, and that's in part because of this amazing system in Focus del Toro, where people often study sexual selection on color signals, um, but also there's, um, so you probably know Rasmus is studying the evolution of, of patterning in, in these um, Renita Maya frogs, and also they've been the subject of studies of Batesian and Molarian mimicry. So there's numerous cases of both in the family, notably between Alabates, which is non, it, it's undefended, and Amarega that has chemical defenses. And these two genera mimic each other all over the Amazon. So most of the study on signal evolution in poison frogs has focused on this, this large clade. So this clade, all of them have chemical defenses, and they all have bright color signals. So Epipenobates is an awesome alternative because it's much younger and it shows a lot of these intermediate phenotypes. So if we really want to understand how aposematism evolves, this is precisely the system that, that needs to be studied. And they really do show every color of the rainbow, although I have to say they don't taste as good. Uh, okay, so um, in a qualitative sense, if we just look at the pattern of, of, of color evolution in the group, this is the sister clade, Silverstonia, and this is, these are the oldest lineages within the group, um, which fall into the Bull and Jerry clades. And so we can predict that Bull and Jerry kind of represents what the ancestral Epipetobates phenotype was. The clade Machalia looks fairly similar, however they've lost the modeling on the belly, so they have uh, an immaculate ventor. And they also have this uh, bright orange flash marking, so they are Mostly cryptic, but they are distinct from the ancestral phenotype. Anth Epipenobates anthony, on the other hand, clearly has very different coloration. It's much more showy. Again, this is the population, the, the species that shows an increase in defense. So we can say here that there is likely an origin of increased conspicuousness <coughs> in the ancestor of anthony. So again, I want to point out these are the three broad ranging species. Bull and Jerry is the northernmost, uh, Machalia occupies the central corridor, and Anthony occurs in the south. But there are these other four species, right? Where do they fit? Well, so uh, phylogenetically, it turns out that Naranensis is sister to these oldest clades of Bull and Jerry. That Darwin Wallacey is simply a morph of Bull and Jerry that falls within this clade. <coughs> and that tricolor phylogenetically falls within Machalia. So clearly within these broad ranging species, there's been multiple origins of different coloration. Whether or not, you know, you could argue this is potentially less conspicuous, given that it's green, but it, there has been a, a shift in coloration in these frogs. The other thing I'd like to point out from a qualitative perspective is that this entire clade, so Anthony, Machalia, and Tricolor, they all have this groin flash marking that's absent in Bull and Jerry. So we can also say that this groin spot evolved in the ancestor of this clade. But I really wanted to take a quantitative view on how color evolves in Epipetobates. So what I did is I took color images of the back, the venter, and the side, and I partitioned them into different pattern components. And I measured different values that represent color. So I took RGB values and I calculated two different channels that represent long wavelength RG and short wavelength GB color, as well as luminance. So luminance is a measure of brightness, so how close the color is to white. And this is important because it's presumably a part of this, excuse me, the evolution of aposematism requires that they are brighter, that they are showier than their environment. And the last component that I measured was for each pattern component, the percent of the frog that was covered with that <coughs> pattern. So we can also include pattern evolution in our large data matrix representing color. And in this project, I've been interested in, in answering a, a couple of questions. Firstly, do evolutionary rates of, col of color differ among the species? So this could indicate shifts in, in color phenotype. 
Second, do they differ between sexes? So uh, this would suggest, for example, that there's different types of selective regimes on males and females. Thirdly, do they differ among body regions? And my thinking behind this is that generally the, the dorsum of, of a frog is very, uh, very obvious to bird predator, for example, and also very uh, obvious to their conspecifics, while the venter may not be as displayed. So there might be different levels of selection on different aspects of the body. And lastly, I was interested in whether evolutionary rates differed among color measurements. So if there's different types of selection on different aspects of color, then you should see different evolutionary rates. So for example, uh, brightness might be evolving way faster than, than say, you know, the, how green the frog is, something like that. And so I calculated evolutionary rates in R using geomorph. Uh, and just to orient you, the, this is a measure of evolutionary rate. It's, it's arbitrary, and what I want you to, to concentrate on here is the differences among different species. So this is Anthony, Bollingeri, Machalia, and Tricolor. And what this represents, I did bootstrapping, so this is a, a, an estimate with some amount of, of variance re representing the data. And these are 90% confidence intervals. So if I've, I've added letters to denote whether or not they overlap. And you'll notice this, the lowest rate occurs in bull and jerry. This makes sense given that bull and jerry represents the ancestral phenotype. The second lowest is Machalia. So I, as I noted, Machalia looks like the ancestral phenotype, but it has a few key differences. <coughs> this, the evolution of this warnings, uh, this flash marking in the groin, and also the, the white venter. So it makes sense that it has this intermediate <coughs> rate of, of color evolution. And, and the top two were, the, the fastest rates were in Anthony and Tricolor, which to us visually also look much more conspicuous and very different from Bull and Jerry. And also they have huge variances. So these patterns, these higher evolutionary rates suggest that there's been diversifying selection on color signals. So it's producing a higher diversity of color in these two species. And it's plausible that, that what's going on is once a, a bright color signal evolves, now it's under all sorts of different selection pressures from, from conspecifics, from different types of predators, in different environments, on different backgrounds. And this is really promoting the diversification of color signals in this group. And this is obvious if you look across populations. They vary quite a lot in color. Between species, we found no, no difference in evolutionary rates. So this, this uh, shows lack of support for any <coughs> sexual selection going on in, in epipedobetes. And then, so this is a slightly different representation of the data. So here, these are subsets of the same data using the same individuals, which meant we had to compare them statistically a little bit differently. But basically, th this is a simulated, the uh, upper confidence limit of a simulated data set with the same size. And in every case, our observed data overlapped with the simulated intervals. So uh, we found no difference in how color evolves across body regions. And this was really against what I predicted. So it could be, for example, that the development of color pattern across the entire body is so correlated that if you induce a change in one aspect of color on the, the dorsum, it's going to result in a change on the venter or something like that. But clearly, they're not evolving at, at different rates. What was really interesting that came out of this project is that rates occur to dif uh, rates appear to differ among color measurements, and specifically, we found that the measurements of color channels, so red, green, and green, blue evolved much faster than measurements of, of luminance and percent area. And to, to, to show you what I mean by this is here on the, on the left, these are color photographs of different species of epipedobates. You'll notice, for example, if you focus on this, this dorsolateral stripe, that it's quite different in color across species. However, if you look at the luminance of this stripe across species, it's very, very similar. So we're seeing diversification of color, but not necessarily brightness. And this is not necessarily what I predicted, in part because we, we think that a lot of the predators of these frogs are visual. So the frogs are diurnal, and most of the studies that have looked at who's eating these frogs use clay models. And in the clay model experiments, 
they have identified birds to be a, a primary predator. But I think that you know the, these experiments bias results towards visual predators, and it may not necessarily show that that snakes and crabs, which we also know to be major predators, are are doing the, pulling the same weight. So I actually expected to see that luminance evolved quickly, um, but here our evidence suggests that the color is, is evolving faster than, than brightness. Sorry, and the, what, I, what I mean by, by luminance evolving more quickly is that, for example, crabs and spiders, they don't see color. So if, they're, if, if a signal is aposematic to them, it would be bright, and what would be important is luminance, not color. So what, what have we learned from Epipedobates about these visual signals? Well, it appears that, that, that these bright color signals have evolved multiple times from within <coughs> large ranging cryptic species. That these visual signals have uh, evolved at similar rates across body regions, contrary to what I predicted. And that color is under more diverse or stronger selection than brightness. So we put this all together onto the, the phylogeny of Epipedobetes, we can say the ancestor alkaloid resistance evolved through these genetic changes in the target of the, of the alkaloids that they have. And this evolved at the same time as defense. However, uh, uh, sorry, the, and then the reddish groin spot evolved in this subclade of Anthony, Machalia, and Tricolor. And this preceded an increase in in both defense and potentially a change in diet in the ancestor of Anthony. And there's been a number of, of instances of, of shifts in coloration. So if we, if we think about this again with the conceptual backdrop, there are no epipedobates that don't have defense. So we're already, we're starting a little bit further down on this defense scale. And all of them have resistance. So this suggests these two traits are, are necessary to have, um, to have at once, and they're, they're tightly correlated in an evolutionary sense. We've seen that these visual signals arise frequently from cryptic morphs, and often this is without a change in defense. So, so going up here to moderate signals appears to be easy. But what's really interesting is thinking about this large shift. So the one clade. Anthony has both very high signals and very high levels of defense. And there appears to be no intermediates here. And what this suggests is that these that um, moderate conspicuousness readily evolves following origins of defense, but high conspicuousness can potentially only evolve if defense also increases. So we can say that, that signal can be almost predicted by defense. So the mechanism underlying shifts in signal is tightly correlated to changes in defense. Whereas the change in defense is, is likely related to resistance and diet, so what they're eating and how much toxin they can resist. And this also goes hand in hand with, with uh, mechanisms of sequestration, uh, which we actually don't know much about. Okay, so the only thing I would add to this, this diagram is that there <coughs> appears to be another interplay between defense and signal, where in order to make these huge shifts towards very conspicuous signals, there must also be a concurrent increase in, in defense. So where is, is this research going in the future? So as I said, I'm working on 600 million Illumina reads, uh, trying to put together a DDRAD phylogeny of this, this genus and revising the species that, that I think probably don't warrant species status. And I also, on all of these individuals, I have diet data, color data, and alkaloid skin data. So I think it'll give us even better insight <coughs> into how these traits diversify. And I'm also interested, re most recently, with these, um, these transects between, between very divergent morphs and I'm interested in exactly what aspects of the environment promote these changes and whether or not it's something within the organism or potentially this elevational scale um, or the predators. So potentially the predators can be distinct at these different environments. I'm also interested in integrating sensory system adaptation. So as I, I mentioned yesterday, these alkaloids taste bitter. So in other animals that are specialized on bitter compounds, they're, 
they're less sensitive to bitter tastes, and this results in a direct change in their behavior. So I think epipedobates, we might be able to find some fine scale variation in these traits, and we could do some really cool experimental research. I'm also interested in looking at the population genetics of hybridization. We found, I only presented one transect, we found a second transect where Machalia and Bollingeri are also interbreeding, and also I think uh, Machalia <coughs> and Anthony are likely interbreeding. So it really calls into question the systematics of this group, you know, and especially in contrast to, to Oophaga familia, which we consider to be one species. So why are these considered to be separate? And uh, I didn't add it here, but I've gotten a lot of questions about, um, you know, will I work on other frogs and what other aspects of the system am I interested in? So, so going forward, I'm really interested in developing a framework of understanding of how chemical defenses have evolved. And this is something that has evolved a ton of times in lots of different amphibians. And I'm really interested in, in applying the, these ideas to amphibians all over the world. And I'd love to going forward work with diverse amphibians, and I think being at the MBZ would be just the perfect place to do it. The last thing I just want to mention that uh, I think that outreach and education are very important. I have done a lot of outreach work. Um, this is Explore UT. Uh, that is, it's kind of like Cal Day where we invite students from all over the state to come and see what, uh, what people at UT are doing. And I've really enjoyed getting people uh, to hold their first frog and seeing their face. <laughs> so um, I think that um, as part of my research mission, I really want to get kids out in, into, the na into nature, get kids interacting with, with frogs, um, and finding uh, all of the amazing animals that live here in California. I also want to start a local research program with the newts and garter snakes. So my, my interest in this is that the newts have tetrodotoxin and the garter snakes, despite this defense, readily eat the newts. But what's really interesting to me is that they are holding on to tetrodotoxin in their livers for months at a time. So they're, they're resistant, yet uh, they're not yet sequestering the toxins, but they appear to be in this intermediate zone where we could take snakes in to the lab and do some really cool physiology and try to get at the genetics and physiology underlying this intermediate stage between organisms that eat things that are toxic to organisms that acquire toxins from what they eat. And the last thing I want to point out is, is that I've been working uh, in collaboration with, with a university in Ecuador for about 10 years now, so I'm interested in and making this connect this collaboration something more official, potentially with some sort of international exchange program. So Ecuador, for its size, is the most biodiverse country in the world. So it really offers amazing opportunities for fieldwork with really any kind of organism. And the institute that I'm working with there, the Universidad Católica in Quito, they don't have a PhD program, but they do have a master's program, and they want to start a PhD program. And this is something that my collaborator is, is starting. And I think it would be an awesome opportunity to be able to provide training for them in genomics and modern bioinformatics, and also send our students there to study their amazing biodiversity. With that, I'd like to say thank you again for coming, and, and are there any questions? has been done has shown that they don't reflect in UV, which is interesting. And um, I, we're sequencing the opsins. So the other project that I, I forgot to mention is uh, we're sequencing about 150 genes across the entire family of poison frogs. Among those are, are opsins and, and genes putatively involved in color, um, genes that are targeted by the toxins and are involved in resistance, uh, and, and um, genes involved in detoxification. 
So as far as opsin goes, we have preliminary data that they've maybe lost their UV receptor. Yes. Uh, I have read about those experiments with the dendrobodies and that they use clay models to test the, mm -hmm. if the predators are attracted or, or avoid them. Uh -huh. And has anyone done that with this particular genus to test the aposematism hypothesis and if the color really is a signal for defense? Sure. So the, the study that has been done is, it's a 2005 study by Kat Darst. And what she did was, and at the time actually, uh, Epipunobates and Amarega were thought to be the same clade. So she did a comparison between, there's some Amarega species that aren't brightly colored, um, and uh, I don't remember all the details, but she found essentially that, that color was related to predator deterrence. So these, uh, and I think it's with Amarega. At the time they were called Epipunobates, but no one has done them with this subgroup, I don't think. Yeah. It would be worth doing. Yeah. Yes. So um, one thing I just can't figure out here is you've got these, these frogs that are just kind of all over the place in terms of color. Mm -hmm. And then you've got heliconias that have got, kind of got the same strategy where they're, they're toxic to, to predators and they're they will evolve to look the same. So what, why should it be different? Do you, do you have an idea as to why, why do one versus the other? So why do they why do they have a diversity of color signals? Yeah, I mean, in, in Heliconius, they've evolved all to look the same, whereas here it seems that they're, they're, they're all evolving to look different. It's a really good question. I think part of it is that the light environments are really different, maybe for I, I don't know too much about the ecology of, of Heliconius, but maybe in the, in the sky, you know, the light is more constant than if you compare, say, a dry tropical rainforest and a wet tropical rainforest, or high elevation and low elevation. The preponderance of crabs <coughs> versus bird predation. I mean, there's a ton of ideas of what's really driving this. I'm really intrigued, though, that the pattern we find that it's, it's a wide-ranging cryptic clade, and from that clade in peripheral populations, it seems like these bright colors are evolving. So it could be predators are distinct, or the light environment, but I, we don't really have an answer. Hmm. Yeah. You mentioned that um, there are predators of these frogs, including crabs and snakes and birds, and I'm wondering how. How that happens, and do the predators have resistance, and mm -hmm. um, how much predation is there? Sure. So, so the idea of why aposematism is a successful strategy is that you you are released from predation. <coughs> but clearly, that's also not true. Right. Um, presumably, they they do experience lower levels of predation, or at least a lag in time before someone uh, evolves resistance. So in the most toxic poison frogs, uh, which are the phyllobates group, they, they have the trachotoxin, which is extremely potent toxin. It's, it's the most potent naturally occurring toxin on Earth. <coughs> and if you look at the genetic basis of resistance to the trachotoxin, it involves uh, amino acid substitutions in the voltage-gated sodium channel. And you see the exact change in their snake predators. So the snakes have evolved resistance. Now th this is the case where it's an extremely potent toxin, so presumably selection for resistance is very high if you're going to eat it. Um, for all of the other alkaloids they have, uh, we tend to think that what's really deterring predation is, is the bitter taste. Oh, so they're not really that toxic. It's not ne necessarily going to kill their predators. Oh. But, the, so it also depends on the size of the predator, right? So the smaller the predator is, the more toxic it's going to be to them. And if you test this on small arthropods like mosquitoes, they die. So, you know, it depends what predator you're talking about. Um, it seems like also there's some interesting work looking at tetrodotoxin resistance in, in birds, where it appears that birds that don't eat tetrodotoxin are resistant. So, you know, a lot of these lineages have a long, complicated history with, with environmental toxins. And they could, by chance, have a low level or cross tolerance to some of these um, if they are if they're eating enough quantity for it to 
really matter. Yeah. Is there a seasonal variation in the toxicity of frogs and if you were to bring them into the lab and eliminate their mite and ant ingestion, mm -hmm. would they lose their toxicity? Yes. So any poison frog in captivity um, is going to be non-toxic. So if you take one directly from the wild, it will slowly lose its toxins. They've shown that it can last up to eight years. So they can hold on to them for a while. And the bigger they are, the more they have, so they'll keep it longer. Um, and what was your other question? Oh, Seasonal. they change over time. Yeah. So there's an amazing study that, that chronicled um, 30 years of, tox of alkaloid data in one species, in Oophaga familia. <coughs> and it definitely shows that, that these alkaloid defenses change a lot over time. And that depends directly on the arthropod assemblages. So if you change the arthropods, you change the, the alkaloids. Um, yeah, and the, yeah, this occurs along you know the age of the frogs or the habitats they're in. It's 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 the definition of hypocytism in this group is that it's just like so variable. Yeah. Uh huh. So you mentioned that you're 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 skeptical about some of the species within the group, and so you're collecting this rat seek data, and you want to sort of evaluate that. I'm just wondering what your how you're going to decide species yeah. limits in this group <laughs> using those data. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, <laughs> at this point, I don't have a straightforward answer. Um, be in part because, you know, um, they appear to be interbreeding between distinct, genetically distinct clades. And the phylogeny I'm building right now is, is not including those, uh, those intermediate populations. But, as, you know, at some point we're going to put all of it together and see what kind of weird network it creates. Uh, it's not going to be straightforward at all, um, and it, it, some of it's going to be arbitrary because, you know, it, it, it depends on your definition of a species, and it's going to be a tough project, but it'll be interesting. Just sort of a follow-up, is there mating isolation based on color? So in, so in, o, in Ophega Pamilio, um, there's a study showing that there's one island where on either side of the island there's two different morphs. And in the middle, there's um, kind of intermediates. But if you, if you take the, the extreme populations and then you, you put them in y maze choice experiments, the I believe it's the females that prefer their own morph. But it's so okay, so it's, sorry, it's yellow and green. It's something like the yellow prefer to mate with yellow, and and then green prefers to mate, or, or sorry, green prefers either. It has no preference. So. That's the only real evidence we have that they might prefer a specific morph. None of that has been done with Epipedobates. We're, we're just getting started. And that, that's where I think having a lab colony could be really fun. Do the calls differ between these species? The calls are different. Um, actually, I have a slide on this. Um, yeah, so um, just to orient you, this is um, uh, a non-metric dimensional scaling of call parameters, and these in in the colors are Epipedobates species. In gray scale are Colocetus and Silverstonia. So Silverstonia is the sister clade to Epipedobates, and you can see the the call parameter space of the clade is is just as big as you know other genera. Um, but for example, Darren Wallacey, which is a sub clade of Bull and Jerry is, is kind of intermediate. So is Espinosai, which I didn't talk about, but is also a subclade of Bull and Jerry. And then some of them are quite distinct, but there's a lot of variation. Do you know Pamelia would look like that? Um, no, I, that would be awesome to see. But so in this transect that we did from, from Machalia to Tricolor, this elevational transect, there are intermediate calls in the hybrid, hybrid populations. What about the bull and jury? Do they have different calls and different populations of them? They do, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could, you could just call them cryptic um, convergent species. They're, they could be just, you know, <clears throat> you could be a splitter, I think. It might make it more sense. It <laughs> 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 might be a lot easier, actually. It might them. correspond to the habitat and environmental ingredients um, in a real <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think this is just a problem inherent with aposematic groups. You know, it's just like so. Um, you want to call them different species, but yeah. Sorry, I'm looking for one. No way, I mean, you can't really justify bull injury being 
call them one thing. Oh no, we're definitely gonna have to split the yeah. jury. It's whether or not, for example, tricolor. Yeah. If, tri if we put tricolor in with Machulia, that's definitely phylogenetically. That's definitely the case. But this is one locus. Yes, so yeah, hopefully with DD rad data we have much better resolution. Jim's itching to say something. Well, I'm just thinking, I mean, who cares what these, but the tricolor of different species or not? Mm -hmm. The more interesting question is the divergence in that color mm -hmm. in the face of gene flow because it evolved from the thing that's down slope. Yeah. So that's where I would, I mean, if yeah. I was studying this system, and I tried to with Andy and Mice years ago, but didn't have the techniques now. Yeah. But if I was studying the system, that's the question I'd be asking. Not species bound. Well, you care. <laughs> 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 they know. They know. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Speak freely. <laughs> <laughs> Population on an island, and it's it's the type locality of Bull and Jerry, and this is the mainland population of Bull and Jerry. So they also have, you know, they follow Bergman's rule on elevational gradients, and also on the island they're way bigger. Granted, they only occur on one island, so it's you know n of one, <laughs> but um, their calls are completely distinct on the island as well. So it's also tempting to be like, well, maybe you know, maybe that's a different species. I don't know. <laughs> Can you cross? Them? Uh, that would be fun to try. But these are all culturable, or at least many of them. They're are. very easy to keep in the lab. And the people I've talked to say that the problem is they have too many, that they just keep breeding. <laughs> Can you export live animals from Ecuador? Yes. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Oh, one more. Yeah, you got one. Kill the mood. If it's over, it's over. I no, no, go ahead. Yeah, I <laughs> so I, uh, I may have some of the details wrong, but it seems like you have you have the evolutionary rate of change in color, and some of the cryptic species is, is basically nil, you know, like, mm -hmm. very small. Um, and then emerging from within those very recently, you have super bright in color, nominal species, but really just populations. Mm -hmm. So where is that variation coming from? Is that telling you anything about kind of the genetic basis of the color that you're seeing? Yeah, where's that, where that variation coming what, from? What's the genetic basis of the variation? Yeah, and from a ho fairly homogeneous um, species in general, where do you get these wildly different colored populations? Well, so, I mean, given that they tend to be peripheral populations, it could be drift, it could be change in environment where, where there's actually strong selection for color signals, given that they do have this underlying level of defense, and it seems like basically you evolve defense and that promotes evolution of, of color change. So this is kind of an underlying mechanism by which it you know, should be generating all of these different color morphs. Uh, as far as the genetics, we're, we're sequencing the genes, that, or at least candidate genes underlying color. Uh, there's a recent publication looking at MC1R evolution and, and other poison frogs uh, that show kind of loss of function that results in more melanized or less melanized morphs. So uh, I don't have an answer for you yet, but it's a question I'm trying to answer. Okay, let's thank Rebecca once more.